Welcome to the CDA Institute's Expert Series, the podcast that brings you critical discussions with thought leaders in defense, security, and global affairs. I'm your host, Josh Malm. In today's episode, the last episode of this season, Professor of Practice at McGill's Institute for the Study of International Development and Distinguished Fellow for CG, Rohinton Medora, joins us to discuss the surprising outcome of India's recent election and the factors that influenced it. Rowan Hinton and I cover the unexpected performance of Narendra Modi's BJP, the reasons behind their loss of parliamentary majority, and the broader implications this will have for Prime Minister Modi's domestic and foreign policy. We'll also address the India-Canada relationship, which is under strain following recent international security incidents, particularly the murder of a Canadian citizen at the behest of the Indian government, and finally, what India's election results mean for the health of both Indian and global democracy. The CDA Institute encourages rigorous debate on national security matters through our events, research, and publications. Be sure to check out our new podcast, The Geopolitical Update, with CDA Deputy Director and former Director of Policy to Canada's Minister of National Defence, Joe Varner. Every Friday, Joe will provide in-depth analysis of the most significant geopolitical events of the week. This is the Expert Series. Rohinton, thanks for coming on the show today. It's great to have you back. We have a lot to unpack, so why don't we start off with last week's election results. Narendra Modi declared victory Tuesday, but it wasn't the landslide he'd been predicting as his party lost seats to a stronger than expected opposition. The BJP won 240 seats with the opposition performing quite a lot better than expected after exit polls suggested Modi's alliance was cruising towards an overwhelming victory. That leaves Modi, whose dominance over India has steadily grown since he gained power, dependent on forming a coalition to remain in power. With that said, what factors do you think contributed to this election result? Just about every observer was surprised. Uh, And so my first reason for why we were surprised would be to say that the the polls got it wrong. There's an active debate on why both the long-term polls as well as the exit polls got it wrong, but the bottom line is they had not accurately read the public mood. Uh, The main reason being that the public mood was sour in the heartland of India, where the polls perhaps didn't reach as effectively and as accurately. This said, the question becomes, you know, why was the public mood um, the way it was? Uh, And there's a general sense, um, and there's especially a lot of sort of gloating in the press about uh, the king has fallen, Uh, hubris doesn't pay. And uh, underlying that would be the sense that the image that Prime Minister Modi and the BJP had cultivated of a strong, determined, and effective government and a strong, determined, and effective leader, especially wasn't borne out by the way people saw it. And there's three specific instances that I outline. Uh, One is that the economy, although overall, the numbers show that it's growing by six, 7% and will continue to do so, was not performing equally well for everyone. Inflation is high, especially in foodstuffs. And the growth and boom that India has seen has been highly skewed towards the very rich. As a result, the masses who actually vote in democracies did not see that economic boom that everyone else and the government itself had fooled itself into believing existed. And and, and the, the final reason was that some of the posturing and branding that the government did for itself, particularly around Um, a Hindu first philosophy and inaugurating this very controversial glitzy temple in January as the lead in the the campaign didn't go over well, even with Hindus. And so there's a sort of sociocultural reason here, which is all of that posturing was seen as A, coming at the expense of economic progress for the average Indian, and B, given the, the strict hierarchy in in Hinduism was seen as perhaps favoring the upper castes as much and not so much the middle and lower castes. And so the strong branding uh, backfired in this case when it was supposed to lead him to a victory. How could the loss of the BJP's parliamentary majority affect political dynamics in India? And what challenges might that pose for Prime Minister Modi, especially as he needs to form a coalition government? So just, just some very quick numbers on this. Uh, You need 272 seats in a parliament of 543 to have an absolute majority. 
uh, Prime Minister Modi's BJP party won 240, and he is relying on two small, um, relatively secular regional parties to bring him to a majority of 293 seats. So the bottom line is if the coalition holds, he still has a healthy majority of 293 seats in a parliament where you need 272. Both partners uh, who have between them 16 and 12 seats respectively would have to leave the government for there to be a serious governance crisis. And so I think it's safe to say that if the coalition talks and the sharing of ministries, which is what's going on as we speak, works, then this is still a quite stable majority. This said, it is a chastened majority, and that's the gist of your question. It will be chastened in a way that some of the cultural and non-economic excesses and rhetoric might be tamed down. The government will always have to watch what it can do, unlike in the previous government, where uh, it had an absolute majority. That said, this could work the, in the opposite direction too, which is uh, being in a minority situation, the government may want to make points by being even more assertive in some social and policy areas. But I bet on the former, that this is a chastened majority. And as with all chastened majorities, um, some of the imagery will be less and there'll be more of an emphasis on keeping the coalition together and on delivering results. What can we anticipate in terms of stability and governance more generally in India following the formation of this new government under Modi? Yeah, so as, as I was saying before, uh, there are two parties, the Telugu Desam and the Janta Dal, which have 16 and 12 seats respectively. Both would have to be unhappy and leave for the BJP to lose its um, majority. Um, therefore, a lot will depend on the give and take that happens in forming the cabinet. Uh, I think that should that will take several days, and we won't know till next week uh, which uh, ministries were allocated to who, and more importantly, what kinds of economic, mainly economic and financial blandishments were offered. Um, in the case of the Telugu party, for example, they would like uh, their home state to have um, a special status in the Indian uh, Federation. Uh, if that were granted, it's difficult to see why the party would want to leave that coalition. Uh, ditto with the Janta Dal, if they get the ministries that they seek, and some of the economic spoils that go with them. I see this as being a stable coalition, but one in which, as I was saying previously, uh, the, the minority parties will exert an influence on the BJP and keep it on the straight and narrow. How might the outcome of this election impact India's foreign policy priorities and engagements, particularly with its relations with major global powers and regional neighbors? There's two schools of thought on this, I should say, Josh. Um, one is that, as with all great countries, um, there's a continuity in Indian foreign policy and Indian interests that transcends political um, uh, changes. And that will be the case here too, as it has been, as some people argue, there has been continuity in the transition from the old Congress government to the current uh, Modi regime. Um, the second school is a bit more nuanced, and this is where maybe I should spend uh, some time. I guess the thinking here would be that historically Indian foreign policy, let's say from independence in 47 through to about the 1990s, was a left wish, uh, leftish uh, 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 policy that's of, uh, coined along with uh, Egypt and Yugoslavia in particular, the so-called non-aligned, which was a way to keep large developing countries away from the Cold War. In practice, it meant that they were not in the U.S. orbit. They were more often in the Soviet orbit, and that rankled the West. In the 90s, that changed as India opened up, liberalized, and therefore became closer to the U.S. and um, Western Europe. And today, Indian foreign policy's main priority is to triangulate between the U.S. and China. Um, the BJP was criticized by the Congress 
for having wrecked relations with China. Uh, it was criticized by the left for having um, warmer relations with Israel than India has historically had and warmer relations with the U.S. than India has historically had. There was also the sense that India's soft power was being degraded by the repression domestically and the strong arm tactics that the Modi government became known for in suppressing dissent. And all parties more or less ignored in their election manifestos, Russia. So Russia is not the player in Indian foreign policy that the Soviet Union used to be. The question now is what will Modi do differently? I suspect he will continue to court the US. If this government is smart, they will lighten up on some of the things that were giving them a black eye in terms of soft power, uh, thus making them more palatable even to the US left, uh, which was critical of relations with Modi. Um, they will continue to try and improve relations with China, but that's a two-way street. And India will continue to position itself in what, what I call the modern non-aligned movement space, which is strategic autonomy, as it's called in India. Strategic autonomy in a way that India can successfully say, don't ask us to take sides on Russia, Ukraine. Don't ask us to take sides on Israel, Gaza, Palestine. Don't ask, ask us to take sides in a host of issues on which the West assumes that developing countries should be on their side because aren't we all for liberalism and aren't we all um, together in it? And I think India will continue to carve a role for itself as an emerging power in a way that makes it distinct from any one camp. Can we discuss the impact of recent allegations of Indian involvement in international security incidents in Canada and the United States? I'm thinking here the killing of Hardeep Singh Nijar and the reported instances of killing on U.S. soil as well. What is the impact of this been on India's reputation and can you assess the implications for its relationships with Canada and other countries? So the impact on India's relations and India's image overseas of both of these episodes and others in the U.K. and elsewhere has plainly not been good. Um, India sees these episodes as either cooked up or a manifestation of what great powers do anyway. Uh, the rest of the world has seen this as a stain on the traditional uh, Gandhian messy democracy that is India. So that's, that's the caricature. Um, in the Canadian and US cases, in both cases, this is now in the judicial realm. These are now police cases where arrests have been made, and a lot will depend on what kind of evidence is comes out or is allowed to come out or is introduced in these trials. Um, in some senses, it's almost out of the hands of politics. Uh, the chastening of this government, to which we were alluding earlier, might mean that India plays a lighter hand that was being talked about even before the elections, which is to say that this might all be attributed to rogue elements in the Indian Foreign Service, um, in the Indian uh, Secret Services, or it might be that the evidence just isn't strong enough because some of the important evidence cannot be made public or is not made public. Um, all of that points to a situation in which these cases will resolve themselves somehow. I couldn't quite tell you how. The Indian government would like to see the last of them, and it's only beyond that that we will know exactly how India positions itself. Uh, but I don't think these election results as such make much of a difference. I think it's going to be the judicial processes and things that Modi would have wanted to do to resolve these issues anyway. By the way, one last point. Uh, much as we in Canada would like to, as I said in your previous podcast, um, India does not see the Canadian and US cases as fame and is likely to not treat them that way. It needs the US much more than it needs Canada. I wouldn't be surprised if there's more activity to resolve the US situation than there is to resolve the Canadian one. It is easy 
to push Canada around uh, uh, in India. And I'm afraid whether we like that or not, that's the geopolitical reality. For individuals in, in government, policymakers, thought leaders, etc., working on managing our relationship with India at various levels, I'm wondering what advice you might give to those individuals to navigate this quagmire Canada finds itself in with India. We need to prioritize diplomatic relations with India, but might not have the backing or heft as a global superpower like the United States. It also strikes me that relations are particularly bad between the Modi government and uh, the liberal government. Uh, I get the impression that the conservatives in Canada have positioned themselves as being more pro-India and even pro-Modi. And so some of this might even depend on how the Canadian elections next year play out. Um, if the conservatives come to power, it might be that there is a certain warmth and a lot of the current toxicity in the relationship is put behind and the two countries find a way to work together. If the liberals win, then uh, there may be more of the same. Although, as I said in the past, these things are cyclical and it takes time, but relations do come out of a deep freeze. Uh, how and why we can't always predict, but it is possible to see three, four years down the road, but not before even under a liberal government, that somehow Canada-India relations become more pragmatic, warm, it's business as usual, or at least business as usual, not political business as usual. Uh, but at this stage, it's a tough call. And really, I'm not seeing very many bright lights in the immediate future. Uh, we just have to resolve ourselves on that and just hope that nothing really silly happens. Nothing is overdone. How did the election results in India shape global perceptions of India's democratic process and its role as the world's largest democracy? Do you think that these election results send any kind of message to other countries grappling with similar political challenges? That's the relevant question in many ways for the longer term. And the answer, the simple answer is yes. There is a message here for other elections. There's a message here in terms of a global political tide. Um, the Indian elections are, I think, correctly called the greatest show on earth. Um, they are they are a feat to be seen, Josh, and to be observed. Over six weeks, um, you know, 600 million people in a country that remains poor and often illiterate going to assert their vote in a mostly clean manner. That has to be admired because that's what we saw. The election results are being challenged here and there, but not in any major way. They were mostly nonviolent. And so despite some people's misgivings about the Modi government, they reassert in almost everyone's mind that the Indian democracy is vibrant, that the loss of 60 seats, including some crucial ones, for a government that was supposed to romp through another majority shows that elections matter and that the kinds of rhetoric and positions that the BJP was espousing and Modi in particular was espousing did not always go over well. Yes, they still have a majority, a chastened coalition majority, but that people speak. And when you have a democracy, they will speak sometimes too late and perhaps not enough, but democracies have a self-correcting mechanism that we have to admire. And we have to admire it in a country as large and important and symbolic as India. So I'm sort of waxing eloquent because I think your question demands it. But I do think we should take a moment to um, uh, celebrate that side of Indian democracy and the results we just saw. Whatever the results might have been, um, straight majority, straight loss, or coalition majority, India will continue to rise as a global economic and political power. Its trajectory as a counterweight to China in the West will continue to drive Western relations with India. And that that dynamic that we were seeing and studying um, 
until three, year, three days ago has not gone away. There's a continuity here of India's trajectory, um, which I think would have been the same, whatever the results. Um, India continues to be the most likely and the highest growing uh, growth rate country that the IMF and others project for the coming decade. Its de demographic dividend, its advances in technology and the use of technology to fight poverty continue to be beacons for other developing countries. All of that stuff remains. Uh, the India that we hope to see, I think we will continue to see. Um, politics being what they are, we never know, of course. But I think there's a trajectory here that is almost independent of elections, which is not the same as saying elections don't matter. Rohinton, wonderful to have you on again. Thanks again for making time to speak with CDA today. Until next time. That's all for this week's episode of the CDA Institute Expert Series. To learn more about the CDA Institute, you can visit our website at www.cdainstitute.ca or subscribe to our newsletter. Stay tuned this Friday for the latest installment of the Geopolitical Update podcast hosted by Joe Varner. Thanks, and we hope you'll be joining us next time.